This episode is brought to you by Sax.com. At Sax.com, it's easy to find your new vibe. Dive into the Western trend with gold cowboy boots from Stott. Or go full 90s throwback with platforms from Prada. You can shop for everything on your agenda. Whether it's a breezy Zimmerman dress for a garden party or a bright Chloe blazer for brunch. Find inspiration for your new vibe. Every day at Saks.com. Look, Bumble knows you're exhausted by dating. All the, must not take yourself too seriously, and 6-1 since that matters, and what do I even say other than, hey? <sighs> well, that's why they're introducing an all-new Bumble. With exciting features to make compatibility easier, starting the chat better, and dating safer. They've changed, so you don't have to. Download the new Bumble now. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello, and welcome back to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I am your host, Rebecca Larson, and I am once again joined by Dr. Emma. Emma, welcome back. Hi, how are you, Rebecca? I am even better now that you are back in the States. Yes, that, that was a, a wonderful trip. I had a great time and the weather is just beautiful here in Minnesota. So it was a, a delight to be back home. Well, we're happy to have you because I've been really jonesing for some Spanish monarchy talk again. Really? Yeah. More? <laughs> it's never ending, right? And we even it's have never listeners. Ending. It's, it's not. And, the, the you know, that the beauty of it in the 16th century is it's it's very big. It's not just when we say Spanish monarchy. We are referring to a compound, really, of of kingdoms and territories that that one monarch would hold at the same time. It was just called Spanish. Spanish it's, a, it's a convention, really. It's just all the power that the had. Well, first the Trastamaras and then the Habsburgs amass. That is, um, it's been called Spanish monarchy, but it's just a a compound monarchy that is huge in Europe in the 16th century, the biggest. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been having so many fantastic comments on YouTube. And we had one commenter who said they wanted us to do this episode. So today yes. we are talking about the children of Juana. Juana, muy bien. Very good. Yes. Juana. <laughs> Juana the first of Castile. Yeah. Uh, dubbed by very cruel people, the mad. Um, and we've talked about that. So whoever wants to check out that episode, we, we do more of a delve into her his story and the reasons why people have, uh, have dubbed her that. Now there is uh, also a trend to recover her, her legacy and her image and, and start to call her by her rightful name, Juana I of Castile, because she was the successor of Isabel I of Castile, the famous Isabel the Catholic, Isabella, also, this um, trend in Spain, too, now, now that I was there and, and talking to some colleagues of trying to name people by their names, right? So that's why we're mm -hmm. making an effort to call her Juana or Isabel instead of Isabella, which we've talked about, too, is is a is an Italian name that really doesn't have much to do with her or her story. Um, so, yeah, the, the today we are going to concentrate on something that we talked about, which was that Really, despite the fact that uh, Philip the, of Hasburg and Juana I had trouble in their marriage, they were very successful from one of the most important points of view, the fact that they had six children. Yes. Well, let, and for those who have not seen the episode that was just on her, why don't you give a little bit of a backstory on her marriage? Right. So um, when Isabel and Fernando, the so-called Catholic monarchs, decide to um, put their view into expanding their power in Europe after they they are co-ruling, really, and founding Spain because Fer Fernando is king of Aragon, but he's also king in Castile, while uh, Isabel is queen in Castile. They are considered the first uh, Spanish monarchs, really, um, to strengthen their power in Europe because, for example, let's not forget, Fernando had an empire in, in Italy. He was king of Naples. He was king of Sicily. So the crown of Aragon had an empire in Italy. So they were fighting with, for example, the French for new territories in um, in Italy, like Milan and other different territories. Also, the crown of Castile had been fighting France 
in the Atlantic front, in places like Aquitaine and other Guyenne and other places that we talked about. So really, this is the emergence of the global world and these European powers that are trying to expand. Um, and uh, when uh, Aragon and Castile become one with the marriage of uh, Fernando and Isabel, really, they become very powerful. So when they have uh, children, they decide to strengthen that power in Europe by marrying their children to other monarchs that are their allies, mainly allies against France. So one of the main allies that they are able to secure is the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian I. So in this case, the, the, son, of, uh, the son of Maximilian I and his wife, who was Duchess of Burgundy, um, married Juana, who was the third daughter of Isabel and Ferdinand. So the first daughter, Isabel, named after her mother, uh, became, because she was born during the time that um, Isabel and Fernando were still fighting for the throne, she was the one that secured the Portuguese alliance. Then the, the next one was a son, and he was betrothed and married to Margaret of Austria, Philip of Asperg's sister. She came, uh, she came to Burgos, where they were married. Burgos, again, coming up, right? We love uh, that place. Yeah, so this is like a top list of our trip to Europe is Burgos. I'm going to write that down. Start, <laughs> start our <laughs> itinerary. These names and I forget about them. <laughs> so if I need to start looking up things, uh, no, Burgos is, is always there. They marry in Burgos. He dies shortly after. This is why I think a lot of people don't, associate Margaret of Austria so much with the Spanish court, but she stays there because she's pregnant. Uh, finally, she she has the, the daughter that is born, doesn't live, and eventually she goes on to become the Duchess of Savoy and all of the, the governor of the Habsburg Netherlands that we know later on. So this is the context where uh, Juana and Philip uh, are, are, really. She goes because he's also the Archduke of Austria, and because of the Netherlands are part of his inherited, inheritance through his mother, um, too, uh, Juana goes to live there. So she leaves Spain in 1496. Actually, her mother, Isabel, and her little sister, Catalina, Catherine of Aragon, are there in Laredo, uh, that we can also put in the list because it's very relevant. <laughs> <laughs> That's very close to where I'm from. So we'll be able to go to my to my city where Santander, where there's also important for example, Margaret of Austria arrived into Santander. These were the ports of all that um trade um alliance that I had been talk to, talking about, about the wool trade and all that. So everything channeled from those ports into Burgos, where all the wool and all these um commodities from England were traded. So if you if you think about it, um, Juana went to secure that alliance, and she became Archduchess of of Austria before she becomes heiress and finally Queen of of Castile. She, she was not really in the cards to become Queen of Castile, but the death of her sister, for well, of her of her, of her brother, really, because he was the one who was a Prince of Asturias. Uh, shortly after he marries Margaret of Austria, some people say from. Uh, too much use of matrimony. Um, but that was saying at the time because uh, he died shortly after they were married. And then her sister, Isabel, also dies in 1498 after she gives birth to a little baby. That baby becomes really the heir, Miguel de la Paz, to the three kingdoms, really, to Portugal, to Castile, and to Aragon. And he's left by the Portuguese uh, king in the care of his grandmother, Isabel of Castile, who's an old woman now. He, she cares for him, but after two years, he dies too. So uh, after that happens, uh, really what happens is that Juana becomes the successor of Isabel of Castile and by matrimony, Philip of Habsburg. That's how really in the Spanish monarchy, um, the founders are Isabel and Fernando, who are a Trastamara, but really then it's the House of Habsburg that takes over after the, the next generation when Isabella dies in 1504 because in Castile women could inherit, so Juana became the queen, the rightful queen. It's a bit of a mess, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's like a soap opera. 
<laughs> yeah, and then England is always involved. I love that. Yes. Because, for example, any time any member of the Spanish um, of the Spanish royal uh, family in the 1490s or later on is going to travel to England, there's messages sent to, to Henry VII to say, please give protection and safe passage. That's why they had established an alliance with the Tudors, too. With the, with the marriage of Arthur and Catherine to protect this passageway, avoiding France really because this is the enemy. So they couldn't go. Uh, um, they couldn't go uh, inland. They had to go by sea. And when you look at the map, England and the Netherlands are so close that and the, the especially that voyage was very very uh, dangerous mm -hmm. too. Think about the fact that uh, in 1501, when Catherine tries to go to England for the first time, um, they have to go back into Laredo again, that same place where her sister left five years before, prior. And then they couldn't they couldn't leave for another month, mainly because she was very sick. So her apothecary sends for medicine, and and basically, I think she's just terrified to go back in the sea. And then it's Henry the Seventh who sends his. Um, his boats to to escort them to England. So this is how dangerous this was. Yeah. So Juana and Felipe come to Spain as already a king and queen of Castile when they almost uh, drown and they end up in the Tudor court where they meet with Henry the Seventh and they spend a, almost a month there, a long time, really. Yeah, it really is a long time while they're there. Yeah. And so refresh my memory, because I know we've talked about this in a previous episode. By the time they came to England and stayed there for that month, had they any children by, at that time? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pre uh, Juana was pregnant with her sixth child. <laughs> yeah. uh, on that voyage, she was pregnant. Yep. I mean, the any woman in the 16th century, any queen in the 16th century, from the moment she was married... If she was fertile in that sense, she would be pregnant most of the time. And she Think still traveled. That. And she she was married in 1496. And by 40 and 1606, she had six children. Wow. In the case of Juana, she was very lucky, unlike her sisters, and her other sister Maria, too, unlike Catherine, all her children survived. That's extraordinary if you think about that for a royal couple in the 16th century or prior to that. Really. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about these children. Let's start yeah. with the eldest. Mm -hmm. So the eldest was Eleanor, Eleanor of Austria. Now we have to think these are the children of the House of Austria, the Habsburgs. Uh, but because Juana is a ruling queen later on, they are infantas and, and, of, and, and Charles becomes Prince of Asturias too. So they are of Austria and Spain and Castile. They're both. Juana amazing. is also queen of Aragon when her father did. So th these children are uh, the most, they become emperors and queens because they are basically the embodiment of, of two super um, powers joining together, right? Yeah. Uh, like Isabel and, Fer and Fernando, really. So Eleanor was born in, shortly after the wedding, well, a couple of years, 1498. Uh, Eleanor, Eleanor the eldest. Um, so again, a daughter first, like Isabel. So it seems like in, in these women, they always have a daughter first. And Catherine of Aragon had a daughter first, right? Mm -hmm. Something must be that, 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 you know, sometimes you meet families where there's a lot of girls and you're like, something's going up here. So some genetic predisposition to having girls or, some, or something. I mean, let's be fair, though. Catherine did have Henry, Duke of Cornwall, first. She did. She did. She did. But the first miscarriage she had was a girl. Oh, I don't think I remember that. Thank you for yeah. pointing that out. Yeah. So in 1510, she tells her dad. Yeah. So girl, boy. I think then there was another. There was two boys. With Catherine, yeah. too. And Juana had two boys and four girls. Huh. And Isabel, their mother, had one boy and, and four girls. So, yes, boys, but tons of girls. Yeah. And this is the, the, the strength about this is the Spanish monarchy is flexible enough because the women have those rights in Castile to give these women power, really, and influence. So 
that's why the Spanish monarchy really becomes that powerful because it's it's in different places. So the monarch can't be in everywhere. Uh, Charles V is the they say the tra the monarch that traveled the most in the 16th century, but he couldn't be in all of his kingdoms. So he had his sisters to govern for him, and they were all very loyal. They were very tight knit. Family. Well, they were you know cousins and <laughs> <laughs> they were very related right? Right. <laughs> extremely related that was my uncle slash cousin <laughs> yes who I married when I was 15 and he was 45 <laughs> yeah kind of like that you know if you think about it it's um mm. but it, it it's been done in other societies uh to keep power uh to marry within the same family like you know in ancient Egypt for example yeah. It's just a strategy, really. Not a good one when it's a pre-scientific world because they don't know. They, they weren't aware that of the of the things we are aware of, of right. us people that live in a, in a scientific world, right? We know that that's bad for genetics. They didn't know that. They kind of found out along the way. <laughs> I yeah, mean, if we did. think, if we think about, excuse me, if we think about Queen Victoria, I mean, uh -huh. now we're talking 19th century. She married her cousin. She should have known better at that point. What about Elizabeth II? Didn't she marry him? Oh, I cousin? think he was a cousin, too. Yeah, they should have known better. <laughs> I think it's just probably in, in the circle you move in. It's uh, it, it duty comes first, too. Yeah. So you can't just marry anyone. I think it's changed a lot in the 20th century with the Spanish royal family, we've seen the change too. They used to marry their cousins in the 19th century too. So mm -hmm. I think it's just a strategy that was used. So it was normal and, and just acceptable. And nowadays they don't because we are in a different time and we realize it's not, obviously it's not good. So I think it's just depends on the time really. And, and when we say they found along the way about this is because the second child of Philip and, jo and Juana was Charles. Charles Charles was born in 1500. Uh, he was born in the toilet. So Juana was uh, in a party and she wasn't feeling very well and she just went to the toilet and had him. And <laughs> that, yeah. I've never heard that story before. <laughs> yeah, in Ghent. Mm -hmm. So he's known as Charles of Ghent. Like John of Ghent or, you know, yeah. like other people, uh, because he was born there. Um, he was born in 1500. So that's very good to kind of realize where we are historically. Um, I found out the other day that, for example, Charles I of England was born in 1600. So those kind of like milestone moments where um, things are the, the, the most powerful man in the 16th century was born in 1500. That's in the it. toilet. <laughs> In a toilet. <laughs> oh, that's a fantastic story. I'm you sorry. Didn't, you didn't know that? I didn't know that. I've never oh, heard that before. I thought you would like that. Yeah. That's, that's why makes, I brought it up. It makes him you far more leave interesting. You can that part of the story out. <laughs> what a, wow. Wow. And of course, my mind immediately goes, who were the other rulers? So in England, it would have been Henry the Seventh, And in Scotland, mm -hmm. I believe it would have been James the Fourth. Mm -hmm. So that just gives you a little perspective there when he was James born. James IV had, had, had some time left. <laughs> <laughs> Before Catherine came along. <laughs> Before Catherine, uh, yep. Uh, yep. Uh, so Henry VII had been in the, in the throne for 15 years. He was pretty yeah. much, he was getting ready for the marriage. Of, so, for example, London was like for getting ready for the Olympics at the, in 1500. There's letters between um, Catherine and her sister Juana, so they were in contact. Um, uh, so in 1500, Catherine was getting ready to go to England, preparing this humongous diary and collection, really, of, of stuff that she just, things that she just grew accustomed to having. And then she wanted to take, um, I had a very, very interesting conversation about Catherine's paintings in Spain that I might be able to share some of the, Ooh. of the new findings on that because it's really really something really cool so yes we are at the time that there's a lot of um established uh but then th he's born in 1500 and he's a boy so they're super happy because he's the heir and he lives on he dies in 1555 just 1556 i think i was confused mm. his mother and his death 
uh, I can't believe I have a master's in Spanish monarchy and I can't, I don't know. I know when he was born. He was born in the well, I pull, I pulled up Wikipedia, which I okay. don't like to go off of, but it says he died in 1558. 1558. Does that sound right? He retired okay. in 1556. There we go. Because Charles uh, lost it a little bit at the end of his life. Um, and he was said tired, melancholic, and things like that. Basically, he was tired of fighting what happened in, during his, his time in his dominions, which was the Reformation, really. He was a strict, strict Catholic. He was, uh, so he had just seen in the empire, because he was Holy Roman Emperor, yeah. uh, just the Reformation had uh, taken, um, just was one of the things that he he felt that had been a failure. So that's why, for example, he doesn't give that inheritance to his son, Philip II of Spain, who is not Holy Roman Emperor. His brother, who is not the third son, uh, not the third one in, in the marriage of Juana and, and Philip is, he's the fourth, Fernando, Ferdinand. He was, he was Holy Roman Emperor after his brother, uh, Charles V, abdic uh, just said, I need to abdicate, I'm going to Juste, which is a monastery. I'm just going to retire and, and just spend the, whatever I have left in, in prayer and just in solitude. And that's how Philip II inherits the, the the throne when he's king of England, married to Mary Tudor. This is how connected the Tudors mm -hmm. are to the Spanish monarchy. This episode is brought to you by Sax.com. At Sax.com, it's easy to find your new vibe. Dive into the Western trend with gold cowboy boots from Stott. Or go full 90s throwback with platforms from Prada. You can shop for everything on your agenda. Whether it's a breezy Zimmerman dress for a garden party or a bright Chloe blazer for brunch, find inspiration for your new vibe every day at Saks.com. I love these connections. I love that you're opening our eyes to these connections because I think it's so easy to forget how intertwined they were. Well, listen to this. So, so they had Eleanor Charles, then they had Is uh, Isabel, who became um who became queen of denmark and then she her descendants come back in the form of uh anne of denmark who marries uh james the first uh the, the sixth and the first so this is how connected all of this is and then when fernando is born juana is in castile so he's born in alcalá de Henares, the same place that catherine of aragon had been born <laughs> <laughs> but he becomes eventually Holy Roman Emperor. Yeah. This is how these these um, uh, daughters and sons of, of Juana and, and Philip become just, you know, these powerhouse names in Europe, really. Do you know why he didn't choose Philip as his successor as Holy Roman Emperor? Because he thought, yes. So the when let's let's continue saying that for, for Ferdinand Fernando was born in 1503 when Juana was left behind by Philip who went back to Flanders and left Juana with her mom then when Ferdinand is born um Juana is having one of her bad episodes mm. she has a a big confrontation with her mother Isabel she's placed in house arrest basically by her mother and she has a uh, a bad reaction and she stays up all night pregnant uh, outside in the cold and the rain and this and that and then she has out, out outbursts so her mother decides okay you, you need to go to your husband because all that Juana wanted was to go to her husband it's just her mother didn't want her to go pregnant heavily pregnant yeah so once she has the baby she leaves and leaves the baby with uh Isabel and Fernand so the the grandparents mm. and then Isabel dies the following year. So if Ferdinand of Aragon raises Ferdinand of Austria, he's raised in Spain. And when Ferdinand dies, the Spanish subjects want Ferdinand to be king, not Charles, who is still in Flanders with Margaret of Austria and doesn't know a word of Spanish, for example. Mm. This is how complicated this inheritance of Isabel and Fer Fernando is, really becomes, right? Um, so when, what Charles does when 
he comes to, to Spain and they're like, we don't want you as king. You don't even speak Spanish. He could have learned a little bit, if you think about it, to say <laughs> yeah. he was going to be king of Spain. Um, he's like, we want your brother. And then, oh, my brother's gone. I already sent him back. So he sends his brother off. So Ferdinand then acquires all of his political uh, importance in Europe, in Austria, in those places. So when... Um, Charles V is in, at the end of his life and he's deciding his inheritance. He thinks it's too, I think he thinks it's too complicated to keep that together. Hmm. So he decides, well, my brother can continue. It's still the Habsburgs. We can still bring it back together at some point. Uh, but uh, for now, it's too complicated to be king of Spain and uh, with the growing empire in America and Holy Roman Emperor where everybody's Protestant now and there's a lot going on. Yeah, that makes sense. And he saw what, or knew, or found out what his dad had gone through, mm-hmm, having mm-hmm. to deal with all. I mean, it was constant fighting, right? Constant battles, war, trying to achieve and sustain. <laughs> well, you mean Charles V? Yes. No, I love, I love party and yes. having fun and, and <laughs> doing whatever I want because I'm the emperor and king of Spain too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Charles V, they do say he's, and, and let's just finish saying, before we go on to Charles V, then they had another two uh, daughters. They had Maria, Mary of Hungary, who we'll talk about, who is my favorite of all the children of um, of Juana and Ferdinand. I'll tell you why. And then the last one, when they come to Spain, back to Burgos, because everything comes back to Burgos, and they're there, and Ferdinand is, uh, we've talked about this. Let's just recap that. Um, so Juana and Philip of Hasburg come to Spain because they're king and queen of, of Castile and are in Burgos. And they meet with Ferdinand, who is like, well, I'll give you the power because he had been regent during their absence because they were in Flanders. But he says, you know what? Because I don't get along with you, Philip, very well. I'm just going to go to Aragon. And just do my thing, because I'm the king of Aragon, and I need to figure out my own inheritance because I don't have a son, for example. Mm. That was a problem also that Fernando had. Well, Philip dies just a couple days later. (laughs) Very, very abruptly. Ah, here we go again. (laughs) Hmm, There's more than wine in Burgos, I think. (laughs) So the rumor was that he was poisoned by Fernando of Aragon. Well, let's not forget Fernando Baragón is the inspiration to Machiavelli to write The Prince. Mm. He was a great monarch, but he was ruthless. He had fought wars. He had he had he was bloodthirsty. He was a conqueror. He Philip of Habsburg wasn't going to get in his way, so I'm I'm sure he did poison him. Imagine for Juana, who was madly in love with him, yeah, and she's pregnant and she gives birth to her. Last daughter, Mary, who we just talked about, is stayed with Margaret of Austria, was raised by Margaret of Austria in the Netherlands. She has a, a baby daughter that she names after her sister. She names her Catalina. Of course she does. And, and Catalina is placed when uh, Juana is in prison, Catalina is imprisoned with her. So that girl lives imprisoned until her brother, Charles, comes to Spain and is like, we can't have an infanta of Spain in these conditions. And then they sneak her out and Juana just gets so riled up that they have to, that Charles gets all like, Whoa, and, he, and he brings it back. This is how, you know, like every, every family has drama, especially the Hasbergs. <laughs> I was just going to say the same thing. Like you think the Tudors had drama. These guys really These have guys. the drama. <laughs> Tudors, sorry, the Tudors had a bit more sex scandals. These guys are like getting into real fights. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Poisoning each other, you know. <laughs> Poisoning, going crazy if you don't do what I want. Yes. <laughs> Imagine the tension. And then C- Catalina, that, that final daughter, goes on to marry the king of Portugal. When mm. her aunt dies... There's a king of Portugal, Manuel the first who marries three, two Trasamaras and one Hasbert. Yeah, I was just gonna mm. say, wait, wait, this same is the guy, one, same guy. So this is the one that was married to the two sisters separately yep. and now a niece. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, they were related too. <laughs> wow. I just yeah. I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> It's it's just like we were it's a strategy, but it sounds very weird to us because we live in a different time, obviously. Yeah. So this is how complex these six siblings are, really. Some of them are Spanish by birth and by well, birth is one thing and being but being raised in Castile is very different to being raised in the Netherlands with Margaret of Austria. Right. So, for example, the ones that are raised by Margaret of Austria are also raised by the grandfather Maximilian. So, mm -hmm. for example, in the case of Maria, Mary of Hungary, who becomes, she's known as Mary of Hungary because she eventually becomes Queen of Hungary. She is raised by Margaret, but mainly by her grandfather Maximilian, and she becomes the most outstanding patron of the arts in 16th century Europe. Wow. This is just, has, it is not known because. It's always, for years and years and centuries, they thought it was Charles who maneuvered everything, but she was the one really in the in the backstage creating all his image, um, you know, um, commissioning amazing artists like Titian. She deals with Holbein when, when you know, for example, Henry VIII sends Holbein to paint uh, her niece, because then she takes the role of Margaret of Austria when Margaret of Austria dies. She becomes the next... Let's say it, Margaret of Austria, she becomes the the governor of the Hansburg Netherlands, where is one of the focal points of Renaissance production. So she is at the center of an artistic revolution. For example, she has she inherits a portrait gallery from Margaret of Austria, but she takes it to the next level with an artist who's um, just a Titian, who is he's he's creating a revolution in portraiture that will not that will go on for another 150 years that's how much Titian changed everything for example and she's the one that had the most paintings by Titian she uh commissions uh four ginormous paintings of nude men because <laughs> we think of these women of the of the Spanish monarchy as prudes well depends when <laughs> if it's to decorate my palace <laughs> I want big nude men here. <laughs> and then in my oratory, I'll have, you know, my things, but you know, and these, uh, these nude men, two of them are still in the Prado Museum, uh, are, are um, giants from mythology, but what they're really representing is the punishment of the Protestant uh, princes that had, um, that, that were against the rule of Charles V. So it was an allegory of the power of the Hasburgs, really, and the punishment of these princes that had, disobeyed her her brother who she always was in the forefront of defending in terms of propaganda let's say arts and propaganda at this point are very all right so it wasn't like a playgirl spread <laughs> no it was it, it, it was just and this was her palace where she would receive everyone yeah um so this is really just showing the power of the Hasburgs, and she's like so well you want to imagine you're receiving one of those German princes in your palace and you're like this is what happened to the last one he's in hell just uh, forever uh, an eternal you know punishment so. I'm having a flashback now to the other painting of the uh, battle of spurs yeah <laughs> behind them like hey remember this guys <laughs> yeah remember the run <laughs> this is how the the women in the Spanish monarchy used art for example let's let's one of the siblings, Charles, the, the, the most important one in political terms, because he's the king of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor. In the, for example, in the Battle of Pavia, this is a very pivotal moment in European history. He he wins, and Francis the First, King of France, is taken hostage. Well, who had a painting of the Battle of Pavia in his in his collection? Henry the Eighth. <laughs> who do you think sent that? <laughs> Not Francis. It wasn't Francis. <laughs> Francis the first didn't send that. <laughs> in the portrait collection of Henry VIII uh, and, and Catherine of Aragon, because we have to remember, this appears in his inventory, but he didn't acquire all these paintings. There is a double portrait of Francis I and Catherine's uh, niece, Eleanor, the eldest of these siblings. And it's this painting is still in the Royal Collection Trust. And it, they say it's a rara avis, so it's a very kind of unique because it's a double portrait for the chronology is very early. There's um, 
because it is mocking Fra Francis, really, and it's showing Eleanor with a symbol of power, of war and power and peace. But also because there's, uh, there's uh, in, in the background, there's a um, just, uh, jouster, there's a, what do you call it? Um, Tribule, who was the, the guy who, oh, what do you call these guys in the court? They're always jumping about and- A jester? Yes, a jester. Sorry, forgot that word momentarily. <laughs> um, so a jester is in the background pointing to the king. So this is basically some a painting to mock Ooh. Francis I that I'm sure was shown next to the painting of the Battle of Pavia. <laughs> that is still also in the in the in the Royal Collection Trust and is attributed to a German school. So this is the, all these paintings you also have. In this same portrait, in this same painting collection of Henry VIII, a painting of the sack of Rome that happened when the troops of Charles V were very bad and went into Rome and did bad things. So this is a battle, really sending all these pictures to Henry VIII is a battle, really between Charles, Mary of Hungary, and Francis I to win over Henry VIII. And was this at the same time during the Great Matter? Yes. Yes. Around. So Pavia is in 1525. Okay. So 1525, Charles V is still betrothed to Mary Tudor, Princess Mary. A year later, he breaks that commitment and he marries Isabella of Portugal. Right. right? Yeah. And then that's when the whole great matter really breaks out. And that's when Henry VIII decides that his marriage has never been valid. Right. Because he's sick of the Hasburgs. He can't take it anymore. <laughs> Enough with you guys. I'm moving on. Oh, I think, you know, Charles V was twice in England. So they met each other. They also met again after the Philip Cloth of Gold. And they went to Graveline and they were there together. He was in Calais with Henry and Catherine. Charles called Henry his uncle. And obviously, his uh, Catherine, his aunt, but he never. He was like Ferdinand. He really, who he dealt with was Catherine, and he couldn't care less about Henry's feelings. And we know what happens to people that don't um, take into consideration <laughs> that Henry, you know, has a little soft ego that can't be bruised too much because he he loses it. Well, let's be fair. When he decided he wanted to separate from Catherine of Aragon, he was losing a lot of power. He was losing power. Yes, exactly. That's why to try to cheer him up, Sir Henry Guilford, a.k.a. <laughs> Fun Guy, and Catherine have that picture of Theron painted by Holbein. Yeah. So basically they recruit Holbein to cheer up Henry, paint this, and then Henry's like, oh, look what I did. But he's not there anymore. He's not in 1513 anymore. Right. Right. He's in 1527. And then what What? What becomes of Henry VIII internationally? Come on. Let's be honest. Yeah. He becomes more of a laughing stock, I think, than anything. Of course he does. Yeah. Of course. Well, I think he loses respect of a lot of, of the Catholic world, obviously. I think, you know, obvious reasons. <laughs> think well, about it yeah and look at his sisters the ones that he married off internationally they mm -hmm. you know his his sister margaret her husband is killed mm -hmm. she marries some random guy flees right. back to england his other sister marries the uh, old french king he dies she marries one of his best friends comes back without so, telling henry yeah so he's lost all of his connections that should have right. brought his family strength Right. And and then all of this thing is like everybody doing things behind his back. Yes. Because Mary happen. marries Charles Brandon without, you know, and he Henry Henry is not happy. <laughs> Henry's not happy about that. I think he's just realizing that even though he's the king, he doesn't have the respect of a lot of people. Not as much, for example, right. as Catherine of Aragon does. For example, there is a point where the man who is sent to Rome uh, is writing to Empress Isabella, who she married Charles. She didn't have an option. She had to marry her cousin, obviously. The, yeah. the time had come for Charles to marry, and he chose her. But she defends Catherine, and she is the one, because she's left as governor in, in Spain. Uh, Sergio Bravo, by the way, 
who is doing a PhD on her uh, governance. It's just about to finish his PhD. So shout out to him, because I know that's going to be a seminal work. So Sergio, good job. I, I can't wait to read it. Um, she is uh, doing all the the logistics to get all this evidence and witnesses to defend Catherine. And she sends a guy to, to Rome. And this guy is saying, in Rome, the letters of Catherine of Aragon are considered relics mm. because they think she's going to become a saint. Like Thomas More became a saint, right? Right. So Catherine of Aragon could have become a saint. And that's how the way she was considered. I mean, you have to think that the news, for example, of when Thomas More was beheaded, but also when all the Catholic priests were quartered, drowned, quartered, like imagine all these news hitting Rome or hitting the rest of Italy or hitting Spain. Right. I mean, Henry VIII was uh, judged in absentia in Zaragoza for what he was doing to Catherine too. I mean, the, the Catholic world did not did confronted Henry about this. It's just it uh it's just, you know, you are in an island there, you have a, a strength position of, yeah, try to come, try to come, see what happens, right? Yeah. But um, but yeah, he, he was discredited internationally when he did that, really. And then what he tried to do with um Anne Boleyn was was to establish a French alliance, but Francis the first couldn't care less about Henry either, because he was a even a bigger tool than, than Henry VIII. <laughs> I mean, Francis I, mm -hmm. as much as I hate to say, was a lot more powerful than Henry VIII was. He and was he smarter. Was, uh, you know, he was able to bring Leonardo da Vinci to France. So, he, you know, but um, he didn't really, he didn't really care too much about Henry VIII. He cared about Charles V. That's right. who he cared about. So it was the women, for example, <laughs> When Francis I was captured, it was the women who negotiated the peace. So in 1529, there's a thing called the La Paz de las Damas, the peace of the ladies. It's the women who are always like, come on, guys, enough is enough. You know, because yes. that's what the women do in, in those contexts of diplomatic contexts. In the 16th century, we see that like never before. Women are extremely powerful in that sense in the 16th century. There's a book I read years ago by Sarah Griswood called Blood Sisters that I think talks about all of this, how these women, you know, navigated this political world and we don't give them the credit for it. And this book was an eye opener for me. There's a lot of work being done now, but I think there's still more dissemination that needs to be done with this, because when you talk to people about the Renaissance, you still get a lot of the, the male names. Yeah, you'll hear an Isabel of Castile here and there. You'll hear, but Mary of Hungary is not someone who comes up that much. And okay. she was the most important patron of the arts of the 16th century, most probably, in, in many ways and respects. First and foremost, because she was a woman. So uh, it was more difficult for her than for anyone else. In, in all reality, we have to admit that, uh, like we've talked about before, blood was above gender. So these women are not just anyone. They are the descendants of Isabel of Castile, too. And on their father's side of, of Mary of, of Burgundy, of uh, strong women, because in Burgundy, you, too, they had been strong women and a strong presence of women. And if you think about it, when Margaret of Austria is governor of the Hansburg Netherlands, for example, there is quite a few women artists that are included in the books by Giorgio Vasari, for example, who talks about the lives of the famous painters and artists. And he mentions specifically the Netherlands as a place where women are doing outstanding work. And he mentions Susanna Horenburg and he mentions Lavina Turnlich. So it's also that the woman is in charge changes a lot of the things too. Mm -hmm. So women in the 16th century need a, little, a lot more uh, credit for what they were doing. They definitely do. And I'm glad you're talking about them. Yes, yes. So imagine uh, Juana and so to go back to our main topic, which was Juana and Philip's children, Eleanor was uh, became first queen of Portugal, like we said, <laughs> but then queen of France. 
she was hated by Francis I. She was mistreated enormously by him, and but she would still present herself in full Spanish attire because that was a way to slap him in the face, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm wearing your enemy's clothes because you brought me here to be your queen, but I am I am cooler than you, really, if you think about it. Then Charles, like we say, he becomes the most powerful man on earth, but at the same time, his kind of his inheritance is destroyed because it's too much, really. No one can have so much power. I think that's the lesson about him. Uh, Isabel Elizabeth goes on to marry the king of Denmark, and then that creates a connection between England. Scotland and Denmark. So they're involved in all of that later on with Christian IV, who is her descendant, who is the father of Anna of Denmark, who is, becomes Queen of England. So the, this is how far reach these siblings are. Then we have Fernando, born in Spain, but became Holy Roman Emperor. So imagine that voyage from little Alcalá de Henares to becoming the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Right? That's crazy to think about. So <laughs> people never leave their town in this time. And then Maria, we've talked about it's really the brain behind everything and the successor of Margaret of Austria. Right? And then little Catalina, who we said was imprisoned with her mother and then later on became Queen of Portugal. Don't feel that sorry for her. She does have a good life after. And she becomes amazing. She because she's queen in Portugal, and we have to think that Portugal has an empire too at this time, these Portuguese queens are incredibly important for the dissemination of all the stuff that's coming from exotic places. And Catalina is, 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 is there. She's also painted by Antonis Moore. If you want to visit her, when you visit the Prado Museum in room 56, a lot of the paintings are of these people because they're by Antonis Moore, who was a court painter at this time. So he sent to the court of Lisbon to paint Catalina, Catherine of Austria. Then he's sent to England to paint Mary Tudor. And then he's painted Philip and he's painted Charles and he's painted all these people. So when you go to the Prado Museum this summer, I'm sure you will, be careful because the lines and the queues are incredibly long. I would recommend to buy a ticket beforehand. Um, you can go to that room and almost be like, in, in a conversation with them, because these Antonis Moore is such a good portraitist. I mean, you can you can say, I don't know, what do, who do you like best? Do you like Antonis Moore more than Holbein, Rebecca? Oh, I don't know. I'm pretty partial to Holbein. Really? Well, maybe that's the subject matter more than anything. Just all the English, you know, because he really, to me, brought the Tudor court to life. So I can't, okay. I have a hard time not voting him. I, I, yeah, I, I, I think they are... They are at the top, and I don't know. I, I don't think I could choose right now. I <laughs> think that the magic of Holbein is also all those sketches that we have. Yes. And how you can see how, but ugh, Anton is more, the more I study these women, and the more I go to that museum in Madrid, the more the more I'm in love with it, because these portraits, I think maybe when we go to Madrid and you see it, I'll ask you the question again, Rebecca, yes. what do you think? Maybe I'll change my mind. I do like the portrait that he did of Mary that I've seen. He's very yes. talented. So maybe and it would anyone be anyone who is interested in that portrait, the Museo del Prado on their website, they have a very cool video of its restoration because that portrait, listen to this. This is the cool anecdote. Uh, that portrait was taken by Charles V to Yuste. Oh. In his final retirement. When he abdicates... And Mary Tudor becomes queen of Spain. Does not, let's not forget, really, the successor of Charles V, this is like a bomb today, is Mary Tudor because she is queen of England, Ireland, and then, well, France and all those titles that they like to put there, but they have them. And then she becomes, she's Archduchess of Austria. Mm. She's, uh, she's um, and then she becomes queen of the Spanish monarchy. If she would have lived, she would have been the most powerful woman on earth for a long time. And if yeah, they would have had a child, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> That's Imagine what... they named him Henry the Ninth. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, his name would not have been no, Henry. I don't think he would have been Henry. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Well, what would you think they would have named him? Uh, they probably would have had a girl. 
That's true. And they would have named her Catherine. Catherine the Great. No, that's a different one. I know that's a different one. Okay. Then Catherine the Great would have been Catherine the Second Greatest. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Emma, I love it when you come on the show. So it's time for your takeaway. What is the takeaway for today? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if we kept a lot on track in this episode. I kind of like it though when we when we go off track. I think you know my takeaway is I didn't talk too much about Catherine Aragon. I think today did I? No, I was rather impressed. So you really controlled yourself today. <laughs> Maybe we could. I don't know. Let me think about something really cool between them uh, with Catherine Aragon. Well, the fact I did mention her a couple of times, obviously, but she's all she always was uh in contact with her nephews and nieces too she loved them like her own i think the coolest takeaway is that arrival of charles v and i've mentioned this again but we have to picture this in our brains right yeah and him saying hi to everyone even henry and then climbing those stairs and bowing down to his aunt i'm going to repeat this until people realize what this means when an emperor of the holy roman empire had been in england and when he does arrive, he says hi to the King of England. Yeah, sure, sure. And then he goes and kneels in front of who's in charge here? Right. <laughs> who's in charge? Right. Yeah. And he's the Holy Roman Emperor who shouldn't really and have the to. King of Spain. Right. Who shouldn't really bow to anybody, right? Right. Other than and maybe he the Pope. Takes off his hat. It's the the sign of utmost respect because she's doing this amazing work. Of all the daughters of this is my takeaway. Of all the daughters of Isabel of Castile. Really, Catherine of Aragon is the one that is her her continuator. And Charles V knew this. It was like looking at his grandmother, really. That's why I think he was so impressed, too. And then Catherine knew how to, you know, look impressive. She was tiny, but she was mighty. I love that. Uh, so see, I did talk about Catherine Aragon. That's good. You had to get her in there at the end a little bit more. It was yeah. kind of Catherine light. So yes, the aunt's always watching from the from London, right? That's right. If you need something, come to London. I'll, we'll figure it out together. And Charles did need her, so he did. Do you think he would have gone there if she didn't have power? No. Of course, he went twice. Yeah. So that's my takeaway. More uh, let power to Catherine Aragon. Go, Catherine. Team Catherine <laughs> all the way. Catherine. Team Catalina. <laughs> Always. Dr. Emma, thanks again for coming on today. Thank you, Rebecca. Have a great day, guys. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast.